Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. All right, let's face it. My entire career is based on obscure information. The more weird stuff I can find out about an artist, a band, a song, an album, or anything to do with music, the better, right? However, obscure information doesn't necessarily equal useful information, at least not in a practical sense. And yes, some of the information I've uncovered over the years is pretty useless. But I also think there's nothing wrong with useless information. This is the fun stuff, the bits of trivia that give things spice, seams of data that could be mined for bar bets and one-upping your friends, and just the sheer joy of musical nerddom. It's the kind of enlightenment and knowledge that makes one go, wow, that's cool. It means almost nothing to any aspect of my life. It's not going to make me richer or thinner or more attractive, but I'm glad I know it because, well, it's just fun. In fact, I think it's time that I gathered together much of this material and presented it to you in one big glop of illumination, none of which will do you any practical good on this earth. But you will find it interesting. I call this the Completely Useless Information Show. This is the Ongoing History of New Music Podcast with Alan Cross. There we go. We've begun the show on obscure and useless information with a 1990 song called Obscurity Knox by a reasonably obscure Scottish band called the Trash Can Sinatras. They once had a recording studio that they called Shabby Road. They convinced Carly Simon to sing on a song in 2009. And in 2010, they started an American tour by playing in a fan's living room in Portland, Oregon. All 50 tickets sold out in 36 hours. And by all accounts, it was a very good party. Hi there, I'm Alan Cross, and welcome to the Completely Useless Information Show. This is a collection of weird, wonderful, and almost completely pointless bits of musical information. I should, however, point out that this information is not worth less. Uh, like I said at the beginning, if anything you're about to hear makes you go, ooh, cool, then it does have some meaning. It made you feel good. It gave you a nugget of something that you know that your friends don't. And maybe, just maybe, you're able to connect some random piece of input with another totally unrelated scrap of info, and that sets you down a completely new and hopefully purposeful path. Here is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Most of the world subscribes to daylight saving time. In the spring, we turn the clocks ahead. In the fall, we turn them back again. And yes, the proper term is daylight saving time, not daylight savings time. So what does this mass resetting of time itself have to do with Coldplay? Let's go back to 1916. William Willett was a builder. He was famous for high-quality houses he constructed throughout the posher sections of London. Mr. Willett loved to ride his horses in the morning, and after work, he liked a round of golf. But one summer's morning in 1907... He noticed that many of his fellow Britons were still asleep long after the sun had come up. They're sleeping away a perfectly good summer's day, he thought. At the same time, he was rather annoyed when his workday cut short his evening round of golf. It got dark before he could finish his round. This got him thinking. What if the sun could rise later and set later during those wonderful summer months? He published a pamphlet called The Waste of Daylight, and by 1908, he was all over a member of the British Parliament. Here's what we need to do, he said. Starting in April, we'll move the clocks ahead 20 minutes each weekend, meaning that the sun will rise 80 minutes later by the time we get to summer. Then, in September, we'll do it in reverse. Some people thought this was a jolly good idea, including a young politician named Winston Churchill. But by 1910, there were other things to worry about. There was a financial panic, there was a recession, and then the Great War broke out in Europe. But this is actually what tipped things in Willett's favor. Moving the clocks ahead saved money in lighting costs, very important to a nation at war. 
tons of coal could be saved and diverted to the war effort. The Germans knew this too, and had already adopted a form of daylight saving time. The British decided to follow suit. So, on Sunday, May 21st, 1916, the clocks were moved ahead as part of a wartime measure called the Defense of the Realm Act. This plan proved to be so popular with so many people that it stayed in place after the war. Britain kept it, the Germans kept it, and it spread around the world from there. Okay, <laughs> great. What does this have to do with Coldplay? Well, William Willett was singer Chris Martin's great-great-grandfather. So maybe that's why he wrote a song called Clocks. Play and clocks, and we have Chris Martin's great great grandfather to thank for popularizing the spread of the concept of daylight saving time. I think that's cool. It has almost nothing to do with rock, but it's somehow good to know, right? Okay, more useless musical information that I really don't know what to do with. Most standard toilets flush in the key of E flat. I don't know who determined that, I just read it and wrote it down. The Vuvuzela is in the key of B-flat. Termites will eat wood two times faster if they're exposed to heavy metal. And sewer workers in Germany have discovered the poo-eating bacteria eat more poo if you play the Mozart. Again, don't ask me how they discovered this little fact, but you know the Germans. They make good stuff. And here's some ancient history on amplifiers. The modern guitar amplifier didn't come into existence until the 1950s. Big public address systems grew out of the movie theaters of the 1930s. But the need to make quiet things loud extends back hundreds of years. Places like churches and amphitheaters were designed and built to carry the human voice and music to vast crowds. And so were Mayan temples, apparently. If you've ever been to places in Mexico like Tulum or Palenque or Chichen Itza, You'll know what kind of structures I'm talking about. These giant stone edifices constructed over many years. Well, what were they for? Rituals, ceremonies, political gatherings, sporting events, and as loudspeakers. Archaeologists now think that the stone temples at Palenque were designed to amplify and project sound across huge distances. And this included music from drums or shells or flute-like instruments. This was 1,400 years ago. An efficient and completely unplugged PA system for what were essentially concerts, festivals. Okay, I need a song to go along with this piece of information. I could play you something from the Stone Temple Pilots, but that's too obvious. Let's go ahead instead with something cool and obscure. This is a band called the Skate Nigs. They were associated with Alan Jorgensen in ministry and often turned up on some of Al's other projects. In 1992, they recorded an album called Stupid People Shouldn't Breed. And on that record is a song called Loudspeaker. Shut up and listen. He uses words as weapons to hit people over the head with. Shut up and listen. That's kind of fun. Skate Nigs and Loudspeaker from their 1992 album, Stupid People Shouldn't Breed. Here's something else I don't know what to do with. Terje Ingsungset, and I think that's how you pronounce his name. He's a Norwegian musician who experiments with musical instruments made out of ice. Apparently, Swedish glacier ice makes the best trumpet. It's modern experimental music, but I'm not sure really where it fits in the ecosystem. I think it's somewhere near Sigurus and what they do, but I'm not sure. Uh, but still, it's worth a quick listen, don't you think? This is called The Other Side. Terje Insungset with The Other Side from a 2008 record entitled Ice Concerts. Everything in that piece was played on instruments made of nothing but actual ice. Must hurt the lips after a while. As a kid, Joey Ramone was diagnosed with schizophrenia. It became reasonably well known that Joey suffered from obsessive compulsive disorder, which plagued him to the end and drove both his bandmates and his managers nuts. 
It was small things like having to step on and off a curb X number of times before he felt he could go on. He had a number of other rituals like touching various things in his apartment a certain number of times before he felt he could leave. This ended up making him late for things like rehearsals and recording sessions. There was also a time the band landed in London and Joey wanted to immediately turn around because he didn't walk out of his apartment door quite correctly. Here's a story that I've heard, but I can't verify that it's 100% true, but it's entirely possible. Joey was very particular about his glasses in his OCD way and refused to get his prescription updated. And consequently, his vision wasn't what it could have been. On December 30th, 2000, after moving home during some chemotherapy sessions for his lymphoma, he left his building and didn't see the ice on the sidewalk. He slipped, he fell, and he broke his hip. As a result, doctors had to take him off his cancer-fighting drugs, drugs that weakened his immune system so he could undergo surgery for this badly broken hip. He was released for a few days in February, but he was soon back in the hospital. He never went back to his apartment again. The lymphatic cancer then went after Joey's immune system, all but shutting it down and leaving him susceptible to infection, and he died on April 15, 2001. But back to the schizophrenia diagnosis. When he was a kid, Joey was really out of control. He once got into a fight with his mom and put a knife to her throat. That landed him in a mental ward for a month. Here's what his doctors wrote. The patient essentially sees himself with low self-esteem as a combination of being both dangerous and in danger, approaching the unfamiliar with considerable caution and suspicion, frequently employing poor judgment in the process. His sense of self is of a passive, dependent person with ambivalent sexual identification, against which he is inclined to defend himself by means of distancing maneuvers to the point of estrangement. His view of authority is markedly fearful feeling his life to be in danger. The patient's personality structure is consistent with diagnosis of schizophrenia, paranoid type with minimal brain damage, the latter probably of long-standing duration. Now you wonder why Joy ended up writing songs like this. The bottom line, the bottom line, the bottom line. Oh, and one other thing about Joey Ramone. He was an admirer of Charles Manson. Here's a quote. He's like Hitler, only cooler. This is according to Joey's brother, by the way. It has to do with why there's such a history of British bands doing sessions for BBC Radio. When the British Broadcasting Corporation came into existence on January 1st of 1927, it had a very lofty mandate. Its job was to elevate culture in Britain. It was all about educating Britons for the betterment of the nation. Britons were actually encouraged to learn how to listen to the radio. It wasn't supposed to be a passive activity. Radio wasn't a distraction. It wasn't something you listened to while doing something else. No, the BBC actually wanted listeners to sit and pay attention. This explains why the Beeb dedicated so much time and effort to highbrow programming and spoken word. But there was another reason. When the BBC came into being in 1927, the recording industry was just starting to take off. Musicians' unions, record labels, and music publishers were terrified that if the BBC played records over the air, then people would stop buying music because they were getting it all for free. After much negotiation, the BBC and all makers and providers of recorded music in the UK came to an agreement on something they called needle time. From the late 1920s until 1967, the BBC was only permitted to devote a certain amount of time to playing records on the radio. For a while, it was 22 hours a week. Then it was increased to five hours a day. The rest of the time, the BBC was committed to news and talk shows, lectures, game shows, and music had to be provided by live musicians or recordings of live musicians made by the BBC. That's how powerful the Musicians' Union and the Performance Rights Organization was. And even after 1967, needle time provisions continued to affect British radio. It wasn't until 1988 that they were done away with entirely. And if you look at British records manufactured in Britain before 1988, you'll see a notice that says, unauthorized public performance or broadcasting of this record is strictly prohibited. And that refers to the needle time provision in the UK. All this explains why there are so many BBC recordings available. The Beeb had to make them 
to comply with the needle time rules. So in other words, if it hadn't been for needle time restrictions, we'd never have seen people like DJ John Peel in his famous Peel Sessions. This is where he brought in bands to record songs at BBC Studios. It wasn't because he or his bosses really wanted to do this. It was because under the charter of the BBC, they had to. By law. But love, love will tear us apart again. Love, love will tear us apart again. Joy Division, recorded live at the BBC for DJ John Peel on November 26th, 1979. And thanks to the needle time provisions that were in place for all of British radio until 1988, an unbelievable amount of history was captured. Now, speaking of history, if you're a fan of Nirvana, the name Dylan Carlson should be familiar. He was Kurt's best friend, and he was the guy who went with Kurt to Stan Baker Sports in Seattle on March the 30th of 1994 to buy a Remington M11 shotgun for $308.37. Actually, some stories say that Kurt gave him the money and Dylan was the person who actually bought it. See, Dylan's a big gun nut. Now, Dylan was in a band, too. It was a drony, doomy guitar band called Earth. As a favor to Dylan, a pre-Nevermind Kurt offered up some vocals on a song called Divine and Bright that disappeared for years because Dylan was an addict and couldn't hold it together. In 2010, a collection of recordings from that time was reissued on an album called A Bureaucratic Desire for Extra Capsular Extraction, and Divine and Bright is included. So, here's Kurt Cobain singing with his buddy Dylan Carlson and the band Earth. Earth, the droney doom metal band from Seattle, headed up by Kurt Cobain's best friend Dylan Carlson. And yeah, that is Kurt singing on that track, which is called Divine and Bright. Again, I don't know what you can do with that random recording and that random piece of information, but I feel better because at least it's out there. This is a program dedicated to useless musical information. Well, not entirely useless. It's just stuff that I've come across that I don't know what to do with, but I don't want to ignore it because, you know, it's all kind of cool. Now I'm going to show you how Radiohead predicted their own future. Sort of. If you're a fan, you've probably listened to their 2000 CD, Kid A, a million times. But do you know everything about that record? For example, have you taken apart the jewel case it came in? You should, because certain editions feature a second booklet hidden behind the black opaque tray that holds the disc. It's a bit weird with pictures and random bits of text from somewhere. But here's the cool part. Those random words aren't random at all. They're scraps of lyrics from songs that appeared on two future Radiohead albums, Amnesiac in 2001 and Hail to the Thief in 2003. In other words, Radiohead gave fans words to songs from albums that wouldn't be out for another three years. Again, I have no idea what to do with that information, but... I think we can all agree that it's pretty cool, right? Radiohead and everything in its right place from Kid A, the artwork of which offers up some pretty interesting secrets. Here's a question I get all the time. What kind of music should I buy for my cat? uh, Well, if you have a cat around the house, you'll know that he or she can be very sensitive to sound. Cat owners should be most concerned that they be compatible with their feline's musical tastes. Back in 2002, a team of Austrian psychologists, very bored psychologists apparently, spent five days filming cats as they were exposed to various kinds of music. They discovered that when cats heard something they liked, they moved closer to the speakers. When they heard something they didn't like, they moved away. And here's what they found. Cats really seemed to dig music with a really fast beat. What's more, they were into tracks with deep bass. Songs with high frequencies? Not so much. 
So what does this mean for you and your cat? Well, techno would be good. So would certain types of death metal. Just stay away from guitar solos. Cats don't like guitar solos. Again, I have no idea what you can do with that information, but there it is. This last piece of trivia may end up being useful after all, but it's about something that you may have never given moments of thought to. Why do some songs on record have a defined end while others just fade into silence? Who came up with that idea? The answer to the second question is nobody knows. We do know that the first song to fade out came after the introduction of magnetic tape in the recording process. Before tape, all music was recorded mechanically, directly onto a master disc. No overdubs, no punching in to fix up mistakes, no editing. What was played was what was captured. The first successful recording format was the 10-inch 78 RPM record. It had a maximum capacity of about four minutes per side, and that gave songwriters, musicians, and recording engineers a hard deadline for the length of any piece. When tape came along, various manipulations like editing and overdubs became possible, and so did the idea of fading out a song. So why did this catch on? Well, some composers and arrangers didn't have an ending, so it was just easier to let everything fade away. Sometimes songs were just too long for radio. See, radio stations didn't like songs that were more than three minutes long back then, so the quickest way to solve that time issue was to fade out the song before the three-minute mark on the seven-inch singles that radio stations used. Sometimes the producer or the artist wanted to emphasize the hook of the song over and over again as the song ended to burn it into the listener's mind. Some people liked the fade because it left the impression that the song never ended and that it could go on forever. And others did it because, well, they just thought it sounded cool. Whatever the true history, the fade-out has been with us since at least the late 1940s or the very early 1950s. Here's an example of a modern fade-out from the White Stripes. In the modern rock era, most songs seem to have definite endings. So when the White Stripes released this single in 2007, I remember being very surprised by its lack of a conclusion. The White Stripes, fading away. Let me offer up a few more pieces of data that I have no idea what to do with. Leo Fender, the inventor of the Stratocaster and the Telecaster guitars, as well as the seller of many iconic guitar amplifiers. Uh, He couldn't play the guitar. Didn't know how. U2 isn't exactly entirely Irish. Bono and Larry Mullen were born in Ireland, but The Edge was born in London, and his parents are Welsh. Adam Clayton was born in England. And comedian Ricky Gervais was, for a very brief time, the manager of the Britpop band Suede. He was also in his own group called Sedona Dancing. Technical production for this useless bit of information is from Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. 